Hi everybody, this is Tuzi James from the designflaw.com. As the Ebola outbreak story continues to inundate the media with almost a thousand deaths being reported, a controversy is beginning to brew about a potential treatment only being provided at the moment to select Americans. But that is not the only Ebola cure controversy. There was also one in the country of Zaire 30 years ago, where local doctors at the time believed they found a treatment decried by Western medicine. Eight out of the nine patients given the treatment survived. But first, we'll tackle the most recent controversy. As Kathleen Miles reported in an updated Huffington Post article from August 7th, she quoted Lori Garrett, senior global health fellow for the Council on Foreign Relations, saying, We are now in a perfect storm. There is no strategic plan for how this epidemic will be brought under control. Yet later in the article, Miles goes on to describe how two Americans, a doctor and a missionary that contracted the Ebola virus in Liberia, were airlifted to Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, and both saw their conditions approved by varying degrees after receiving an experimental drug previously tested only on monkeys. Garrett did go on to say that their improved condition could be due to other factors and isn't enough to make a determination about the drug, and that there are a number of untested Ebola drugs that may go into safety trials this year but won't be available for widespread production for several years. In a second Huffington Post article published the same day, Rod Nickel reports on another drug being tested that has just been given the green light for limited trials. He reports that shares of Burnaby, British Columbia-based Tecmira surged 40% last week as the worst-ever outbreak of the Ebola virus intensified. The buying spree came even as human tests of Tecmira's treatment, TKM Ebola, were put on hold last month. Tecmira's drug has only been tested in a few dozen healthy people. The FDA stopped its study in July because of safety concerns among people taking the highest doses of the drug who experience problematic immune responses. The hold meant that that particular study cannot proceed, but it does not prevent the company from submitting a new study proposal, saying people already affected with Ebola, for whom any safety risks from the treatment would be mitigated by the risk of dying. In that case, the benefit-risk ratio changes completely, a source within the FDA told Reuters last week. Anything that would shift the risk-benefit to a more favorable outcome could potentially allow the authorization of that study. In the associated video to the former article, Caroline Marassi Tarani interviews former U.S. Surgeon General Richard Carmona about the two patients, Nancy Wrightbull and Dr. Kent Bradley. In it, he describes the nature of the treatment and the general disinterest pharmaceutical companies have had in the Ebola until now. Ebola, of course, has no known cure and a mortality rate of up to 90%, but both Wrightbull and Bradley received an experimental serum before leaving Africa and showed signs of improvement. Now, that's led to controversy over why the American patients received the serum, but not other patients and doctors in Africa. Well, joining us now to tell us more about this is former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Richard Kimona. So, Richard, nice to have you with us. Likewise. Happy to be with you. Uh, so, you know, it help us understand this a little bit more. What is the serum that the two Americans supposedly received? Well, it's experimental. There's a company in San Diego. There's other labs around the country working on the same type of a process where you want to generate antibodies to this virus. So what that means is the, the virus, in, uh, it starts an immune response. So you, in monkeys, you basically get antibodies made, just like in humans, because it's very similar as far as the immune systems. And then they take the antibodies that are made, and they take that serum, and then they'll give it to uh, a human being in this case. And in this case, it seems that uh, it was done as a last-ditch effort. The doctors involved made a determination that although it had not been approved, the risk was worth the uh, potential benefit because they saw the risk as being very low and the potential benefit as being high, and so they went ahead and did it. So, you know, what do you make of this whole controversy around the fact that they received this serum but other patients haven't? Well, that's interesting. Um, certainly it is controversial, but nobody expected this to happen. Uh, and... Um, the challenge we have with these type of uh, vaccines, if you will, and treatments is they're used so infrequently that pharmaceutical companies have not been interested in expending resources to develop uh, uh, vaccines and all of the research that's needed to do so. So you find the lab uh, every once in a while that is doing this type of research, and it was just happenstance that they happened to put this all together at the last minute. A couple of things to note from that video. 
The ex-surgeon general echoed the earlier sentiment that the risk-benefit analysis led them to try the treatment, and also that these types of vaccines don't have much interest from pharmaceutical companies because of their infrequent use, essentially because there hasn't been money in it, until now apparently. Keep that in mind as we rewind almost 30 years. In 1996, PBS's Nova released a film called Ebola, The Plague Fighters, documenting the 1995 Ebola breakout in Zaire, Africa. In this outbreak, almost 250 people died of the virus. In the documentary, it is discovered that a treatment similar to the drugs now being tried on certain infected patients was used on nine patients, with eight of those surviving. The difference in the treatment is that no pharmaceutical was needed, just a transfusion from a healthy survivor. PBS has links to the documentary with some fascinating teaching tools. This link takes us to a somewhat disturbing game designed for ninth graders called Pass It On. In this game, students try to identify patient zero by infecting each other with colored pieces of paper and retra retracing the passage of the disease. Another tool they make available to students is a Word doc with questions for the children who just watched the documentary. A couple of questions at the end stand out. Why did doctors want to transfuse the sick nurse with the blood of Ebola survivors, and why were the foreign doctors against this treatment? That question is answered, if not with real satisfaction, in the following segment of Ebola, the Plague Fighters. In it, you can see the struggle between Western and local doctors in regards to the controversial treatment that ultimately may have saved eight of the nine patients treated. Nicole Organia worked alongside the doctors, always in full protective gear. Somehow, she became infected. The doctors suddenly feel vulnerable. The Zairean physicians devise a plan, one that is experimental. They know that the blood of survivors has antibodies against the virus. They reason that if they transfuse Nicole with that blood, perhaps those antibodies will save her. They take Nicole's blood to type it. Before deciding whether to proceed with their plan, they must find a convalescent with the same blood type. A few last cases show up in the isolation ward. The battle for Nicole's life may be critical for them. As they go about their rounds, the Zairean doctors know that with each passing hour, Nicole's chances for survival decline. Even as they help other patients, the doctors become increasingly convinced that they must execute their plan to save Nicole and perhaps these final few patients as well. The foreign members of the team are against the treatment. There's basic risks in giving an individual blood products from someone else. There's a lot of infectious risks. There's um, HIV is very prevalent. There's hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Certainly in that setting, one of the greatest concerns would be if the person that you're treating doesn't have Ebola, they have malaria or typhoid or something else, and the person that you're getting the transfusion from still has Ebola virus circulating in their blood is, and is infectious, that that would be the worst thing you could do is to give someone who didn't have Ebola, Ebola. The Zairians test Nicole's blood and find a convalescent with matching type. Now they must make a decision. Knowing that the foreign doctors are opposed, they meet privately. What if we transfuse convalescent plasma to someone who doesn't have Ebola? What if our diagnosis is wrong? It's clearly a clinical case. It's obvious she has Ebola. We shouldn't doubt our diagnosis. We've seen so many cases now. We should at least wait until tomorrow. In the meantime, let's present and defend our position in front of the scientific community. What do you think? In America, they don't believe in transfusing patients with convalescent blood. But Never mind, we should answer to ourselves. I think we have to try this experiment. Maybe not on every one of these last few cases, but at least on our nurse. 
Personally, I think we could have transfused her this morning. The diagnosis is clearly Ebola, so I don't see why we should wait another 24 hours. Okay, I think we all agree that we do the transfusion. And that we should do it as soon as possible. Their decision made, the doctors approach a convalescent patient whose blood type matches Nicole's. He agrees to cooperate. Without involving the foreign doctors, they collect his blood and get ready to transfuse. They have the resources only to do a quick AIDS test. Nicole runs the risk of contracting any other disease that may be in the donor's blood. The cure may kill her. Nicole is a subject in a life or death experiment. Similar procedures with animals have failed in the past. The doctors ask her to sign her consent before they proceed. The transfusion is interrupted by a doctor from the Belgian Institute of Tropical Medicine. The Zairean doctors press on. That night, Dr. Masamba, head of the Zairean team, defends the transfusion at a hastily convened international meeting. We felt compelled to try something new. There is no treatment. Tell us if there's something else we can do and we'll do it. But we all know there's nothing. That's why we did the transfusion. We asked our nurse if she wanted us to do the procedure, and she consented in writing. As for transfusing whole blood, we simply don't have the means here to sterilize human plasma. We felt compelled to try something. Now we'll just wait and see what happens. Everyone waits to see whether Nicole will pull through. Tension is palpable. Four days after the transfusion, there seems to be improvement. I'm eating now. I go out. I wash myself so I can get up without any help. Our nurse is doing better. I'm really relieved. I think that after Nicole, other people who get sick may want us to try this same treatment. And personally, I think it will work. A week later, Nicole is weak, but almost fully recovered. Encouraged by their success, the Zairean doctors transfuse eight more patients. Seven survive. The Western doctors remain unconvinced. It would not be my choice to have given these blood transfusions. On the other hand, with the pressure to do something, I can absolutely understand why these experiments were done. I think what's unfortunate from my point of view is that we'll never know whether this worked or not. There's other possible explanations that late in the epidemic, the, the virus may be less virulent after several passages through human hosts. There's a possibility that late in the epidemic, people were having less exposure, that there was some awareness, so people were being more careful, so they were getting smaller um, viral loads when they were getting infected. So the ideal thing would have been to have one group get the transfusions and have one group not get them or get a placebo transfusion. Unfortunately, it's not something we can study in humans. You certainly aren't going to give someone Ebola to, to do a trial like that. We have to wait for a... An, an epidemic situation to do that. So as you can see, over the last 30 years, Western medicine seems to have changed its mind when it comes to the risk-benefit analysis for the Ebola virus. 
in Zaire when it was not a pharmaceutical solution and they weren't Americans, the solution that may have ended up working did not meet their current risk-benefit requirements. Why has this transfusion solution not been tested and perfected in the last 30 years? Why is there a need for monkey-based pharmaceutical solutions? Of these new potential solutions, why are only a couple of Americans being treated with it? Lori Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations says there is no strategic plan for how this epidemic will be brought under control, but where exactly does the blame for that lie? For The Design Flaw, this is Tuzi James.